coming up on Network Africa. Malian soldiers killed in jihadist attack as the country struggles with Islamist insurgency. The former Sudanese ruling council member, Mohamed Suleiman, arrested in the capital, Khartoum. Plus, today marks two years the first COVID-19 infection was identified on the continent. Hello and a warm welcome to the program. I'm Layo Adegoki. Let's begin today with stories and happenings that made headlines over the weekend. Tunisia's president cemented his grip over the judiciary on Sunday, February the 13th, with a decree that lets him dismiss judges or block their promotion, helping consolidate his power after he seized executive authority last summer in a move his foes call a coup. President Kai Said outraged his opponents and alarmed democratic foreign allies with his announcement last week that he was dissolving the Supreme Judicial Council, a body that guaranteed judicial independence. Several thousands of people took to the streets of the capital, Tunis, on Sunday to protest against the measures. The protest was organized by the moderate Islamist Anada, the biggest party in the suspended parliament that has emerged as Said's most vocal opponent and by separate civil society organization. Sudan's military leader, General Abdul Fattah al buran on Saturday, February the 12th, said that meetings between Sudanese and Israeli officials were part of security cooperation rather than political in nature. In his first interview on state television since the coup, Buran said meetings between Israeli and Sudanese officials since the coup had not been high level and only involved the security and intelligence apparatus. Prior to the coup, the military had led steps to reach an agreement in late 2020 to normalize relations with Israel, a move also made by the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, and Morocco. He also said the military is committed to holding elections on time. We, the military, are committed to holding elections on time. Whenever a conducive environment is there, we are working towards creating a conducive environment we are striving for the elections to be held, as mentioned, in mid-2023, and this is what we have continued to confirm, and we hope that everyone can contribute to this goal and for political parties to prepare themselves for these elections, whether they will be held in mid-2023 or towards the end of that year. But the goal is for Midia to be a starting point of preparing for the elections. Still on Saturday, a convoy of fighters moved into Tripoli from the Libyan city of Misrata to show up the interim prime minister amid a push by the parliament to oust him in favor of its own candidate. Interim Prime Minister Abdulhamid al tabeba has sworn he will hand over power only after an election and has rejected the move by parliament this week to appoint former Interior Minister Fatih Bashaga to head a new government. The convoy's arrival underscored the danger of a renewed fighting in Libya as the crisis plays out, following mobilizations in recent weeks by armed fractions back in different political sides. To our main stories for today, two Malian soldiers have been killed in an attack blamed on jihadists. The attack was on the Nyafunki post in central Mali on Sunday morning. However, five of the militants were said to have been killed during the attack. Malian army, which has been struggling to contain a jihadist insurgency, has been carrying out an operation to destroy jihadist bases. Former President Ibrahim Boubacar Keita was ousted by the military in 2020 after being accused of failing in the fight against the insurgency. A Sudanese politician who had been a member of the dissolved joint civilian military government has been arrested. Relatives of Mohammed al Faki Suleiman say he was picked up near his home in the capital, Khartoum. This follows the arrest of two other politicians last week. They are part of a task force trying to dismantle the network established by the former president, Omar al Bashir. He was also attempting to recover money and assets looted during his three-decade rule. 
Sudan is in the midst of a political and economic crisis following a coup in October, which derailed a timetable towards elections. Or well, since the coup, there have been massive demonstrations by the people against the military, but uh, eight, about 80 protesters were killed by security forces during those protests. Upon her return from a five-day trip to Ethiopia, the Deputy Secretary General, the Deputy UN Secretary General, Amina Mohamed, says trust has been broken in Ethiopia and there's a need to, for ways to support the country, the leadership, and also to help the people find their pathway back to rebuilding trust in the government. Well, during her visit, the deputy chief met people living in the regions of Tigray, Amhara, Somali, and Afar, where she witnessed the tragedies of the conflict. She also learned the efforts made by the government and people in Ethiopia in fighting, in ending the fighting. Ms. Mohammed represented the Secretary General at the opening of the 35th session of the Assembly of the African Union, AU, where she spoke with African leaders on pressing issues ranging from development and conflict to the many humanitarian crises it is set in the continent. Trust has been broken in Ethiopia and we need to find ways uh, to support the country, the leadership, the people, find that pathway back uh, to rebuilding that trust and therefore rebuilding peace um, for their people. The message all the way along was that there was no finger pointing for me. It was to say that at this stage with the, the conflict and the tragedies, horrendous at that, uh, no one wins and that peace really is indispensable and for the burden that it has put on the shoulders of women and girls this is quite unacceptable and, and really the, the, the cessation of hostilities was an emergency. Ethiopian women writ large were affected in a way that is unimaginable. In your worst nightmares you cannot imagine what has happened to the women in Ethiopia and this is not by region this is across the regions. I think without a shadow of a doubt, justice and accountability has to be had. I think that's very much part of up front centre of the national dialogues. They cannot achieve um, any lasting peace without reconciling and being held to account the atrocities across the country. And, and so when I say no finger pointing in that region, there is everyone to blame if you want to blame them. They were committed across uh, the borders and the regions that were there and, and accountability must be had. Today marks two years since the first COVID-19 case was detected on the African continent. There is some form of good news coming from the World Health Organization who finds that if current trends continue, the continent can control the pandemic in this year, 2022. However, the WHO is warning that continued vigilance is key. Over the last two years, the continent has witnessed four waves of COVID-19 each with higher peaks or more total new cases than the previous one. Many businesses, families and individuals have been badly devastated by the pandemic. According to the World Bank, the COVID-19 pandemic is estimated to have pushed up to 40 million people into extreme poverty on the continent. In spite of this, the WHO says it is possible to control the pandemic this year if current trends continue. The acute phase of this pandemic will end this year, of course, with one condition, meaning the 70 percent uh, vaccination by mid this year, around June, July. Uh, so uh, if that can be done, the acute phase can, can, can uh, really end. And that's what we're, we're expecting. It's in our hands. And that's why we were saying it's not a matter of chance. It's a matter of choice. Since the start of the pandemic, the WHO has increased the number of laboratories able to detect COVID-19 from two to more than 900. And this is bolstering genetic sequencing efforts in Africa through several initiatives, especially in South Africa. These efforts have led to more than 7,500 samples being sequenced every month in southern Africa compared to a year ago and a more than 54% increase in sequencing data on the continent. In these two years, there were several calls for equity in vaccinations and also medical supplies. 
as Africa was falling behind in the worldwide target for vaccinations especially. Rich countries have administered 14 times more doses of life-saving vaccines and carried out 80 times more tests than their low-income counterparts. In Africa, just 8% of people are fully vaccinated. As wealthier nations roll out third and even fourth booster doses, health workers and older people across the African continent remain unprotected. With the aim of controlling the pandemic, there is now more focus on scaling up COVID-19 vaccine uptake in the countries, which will hopefully limit the emergence of variants. Joining us now for more discussions is the Executive Director of One in Africa, Edwin Ikoria. Thank you for speaking to us on Network Africa. Let me begin with the question of how would you rate Africa's handling of the pandemic in the last two years? I would say they, they've done their best. I mean, I don't know how to characterize it because it is within the within a system where everybody uh, was working nationally and focusing on their own local and domestic um, situation and, and response. It was clear that the African country was working as a whole, was working as a working, working out a collective strategy and a plan. And so, to that extent, I would say they really did their best. Um, of course, the ex, the things that are prevented Africa from achieving what they could have achieved preceded, um, it happened before the pandemic happened, which is basically the structure of our health system, which was really in a very bad shape before um, we, we got the pandemic. Well, let's talk about vaccinations now. There, there are protests in developing countries against vaccinations, but here we're being told, you know, it's the surest protection against the coronavirus. How do we manage these conversations? It is very clear. The rich countries that are currently protesting now have hit at least 70, above 70% 70 vaccination rates. They are doing the third doses, the booster doses and all of that. So they are able to move on, right? So they can organize outdoor events and packed full stadiums and all of that. So they can, they can proceed. But we haven't seen the same level of response on the, in, the, in the South, basically in African low-income countries because of the, of the issue of access. Now, there are people, there are, while majority have, have done this, and then you see hospitalization has gone down, um, the, the, the rate at which people are dying has really re reduced. The question is, what is the science? What is the proof that the vaccines actually help to reduce hospitalizations? And that's exactly where we are now. So it is important for us to see here in the down south whether this has really helped. If it has helped them in the global north to move on, how else can we do it? Now, let's listen. When, when Delta variant showed up in India, look at the way, the rate at which it killed a lot of people, especially in, in India. Now, when Omicron came, look at the rate of infections. So what we are beginning to see is that as new variants develop and, they are, they are the, and the infection escalates, right, more people go on. And what you see on the African continent now is that when the infections are going up and people are, hospitals are getting full, the people rush to get the vaccine because that is the only solution we have right now. Therapeutics are coming out. But we are hoping that the therapeutics will not take so long to get to the African continent. But ultimately, is that everywhere, wherever you are, no matter where you are, you have access to the tools that can help you save you or save lives when the when when uh, um, infections are, arrive. But to prevent further variants from developing, to prevent, and this is mainly because of the rate that we the, the immune system respond to uh, to the virus when they attack, to prevent more variants from happening. Of course, the only solution we have right now is the vaccines. And that's why we, com we continue to promote that the more people get vaccinated, the more people are able to fight the virus, and then the less variants that can be developed, and then we can get out of the pandemic. So that's the, that's the current trend. All right, then, Edwin Ukoria, Executive Director of One in Africa. Thank you for speaking to us. Thank you for having me. Still ahead on the program. Tunisian enthusiast revives an ancient technique to produce natural purple dye out of sea snails. Please stay with us.
Welcome back to the program. Tunisian authorities are requesting from the IMF a new supported program and to hold technical discussions with officials on their reform intentions on the economy of their country. Well, Gary Rice, head of the communications department at the IMF, says there would be an IMF virtual mission from Monday, February 14th to the 22nd to discuss ways of overcoming the economical crisis in the country. Firm, uh, Delphine, that uh, there would be an IMF mission uh, February 14th to 22nd. And I can confirm the status of that uh, mission would be virtual. And, um, you know, where we are on, uh, on Tunisia is um, the Tunisian authorities in the latter part of last year sent uh, a letter to the IMF requesting a new fund supported program. So over the past several months, IMF staff and the Tunisian authorities have held technical discussions focusing on the immediate economic challenges, the country's priorities and um, the reforms to be implemented in order to overcome the crisis in the country. The European Union is highlighting key priorities in the partnership with Nigeria, underlining that trade and investment are top priorities for the bloc. A delegation of European Union officials met with executives of European companies in Nigeria to discuss opportunities and challenges of doing business in the country. The roundtable discussion is coming ahead of a meeting between the European Commission Vice President and top Nigerian government officials in Abuja. EU ambassador in Nigeria, Samuela Isopi, says the European Union would continue its dialogue with the Nigerian government on how to reinforce economic partnership between the two entities. It's about, you know, uh, private sector uh, is about uh, developing the economy. When I say private sector, it's not only uh, to uh, attract or help uh, European Union companies, but also to create good conditions for also for the Nigerian private sector to, uh, to be able to contribute to the development of the country. There are challenges uh, that are well known uh, and these challenges are faced by European companies, by Nigerian companies by, and by companies uh, of any other uh, country. So this is part of our dialogue uh, to see how together we can help improve uh, the business environment and how together we can actually deal with, this, uh, with these challenges. Also, the head of trade and economics for the EU delegation to Nigeria and ECOWAS, John Taylor, says Nigeria's largest trading partner, the EU, is committed to supporting the Nigerian government in developing its economy. We have exports from Nigeria to Spain, to the Netherlands, to Germany, to France. But when you add up all those countries together as the EU, we are actually the largest trading partner. When we look at non-oil trade with, with Nigeria, uh, you're looking at exports from Nigeria of agricultural products. Uh, and we know that the central bank here has played a very strong role in trying to develop certain very specific sectors here, like rice production in the country. Um, the EU is also a major exporter of agricultural products, uh, so we need to find the right balance between the EU and Nigeria to enable farmers here and producers here to grow. And one example where the EU is already very active is the dairy sector. Uh, I Top officials from the UN Food and Agricultural Organization, FAO, have completed a visit to Kenya to raise awareness on the drought and also see FAO's response in action to the Isiolo and Masabit counties in the northern region. The FAO and partners warned on Friday of an extended multi-season drought is driving acute food insecurity in the Horn of Africa with 12 to 14 million people now at risk as crops continue to wither and animals weaken.
We are here for a short period of time, only three to four days, and it's an opportunity for us, as I said, to really understand the work that we have done to successfully beat back the desert locust, but now, most importantly, to really assess firsthand the issues that are being faced by, by the country with the ongoing drought, the uh, continued climate shocks, and the very important impacts that are facing the livestock industry in particular, the pastoralists the farmers and the rural communities in the Asals that are most impacted by these challenges. After years of trial and error, Tunisian enthusiast Mohamed Gassen Noura is reviving an ancient technique to produce natural purple dye from sea snails. Well, this is a product that was so expensive in ancient times that the Romans used to restrict its use to the elite. Uh, a Tunisian history enthusiast is making dye from sea snail shells inspired by a school project decades ago on ancient Carthage and the purple coloring that brought fabulous wealth to the classical world. Mohamed Ghassan Noura works from a hut in his garden to process murex snails using techniques first developed by the Phoenicians to produce a dye known as Tyrian purple that sells online for about $2,500 a gram. Uh, I'm Mohamed Ghassan Nouira. Our ancestors used to extract dye from the murex this way. They break the shell of the murex and then extract the gland. After that, they leave it to ferment and salt for three days, then put it in a tin container, add other substances and leave it on the fire between seven and eight days until the dye dissolves in the water. So expensive was the color even in ancient times that the Romans restricted its use to the elite, whose purple fringe robes became the mark of the Mediterranean's most powerful dynasty. The wealthy class and notable people were those who used purple dye, especially the Senate members. It is used to generate very big amounts of money to the Romans' treasury. Mohammed has turned his criticism into encouragement, which motivates him to keep going, as there's always something new to discover in the craft. Well, it's Valentine's Day today, and all over the world, many people are celebrating love with gifts, flowers, cakes, and many other affectionate ways of showing someone, or perhaps your significant other, that you care. Valentine's Day is celebrated in honor of the third century Roman saint, Saint Valentine, who was a Roman priest and physician who suffered martyrdom during the prosecution of Christians. Well, because of later folk traditions, it has become a crucial cultural, religious and commercial celebration of romance and love in many parts of the globe. Uh, today, global tech company Google is also marking the 2022 Valentine's Day celebration by creating a unique doodle as a way of celebrating the day of love, the doodle icon is, in, involves an animal-themed love story embedded in a video format. Two hamsters were featured and they were both involved in a game of love. So what are you doing this Valentine's Day? That's it on the program today. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Layo Adeguke.